Hi there, it's Elliot. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to squeeze in a quick mention about the Page Learning Lab, our new online learning program for comms professionals. Page and its members are charting the future of the profession, and the lab gives you access to the most progressive thinking on topics ranging from comtech and journey communications to DEI and business skills. It's tailored learning designed to fit into your busy schedule. For more information, please check it out at learning.page.org. The CCO is often the one person in the C-suite, besides the CEO, who has the broadest view across stakeholders and the business environment. That holistic perspective matters more than ever in an era of rapid innovation, disruption, and transformation. What gives the company the best chance to win is usually its ability to see beyond the sticky problems of today and imagine new ways for their business to create value for people and society. Jim Hackett spent about three and a half years as president and CEO of Ford, and he was brought in specifically to do just that for the company. His secret? A design thinking approach, which allowed him to imagine a new kind of future for the iconic auto company. In this episode, we're bringing you his session from our recent Page Annual Conference, a conversation with Marjorie Krauss, the founder and executive chairman of APCO Worldwide, about what businesses and their leaders can learn from the most disruptive and successful innovators. I'm Elliot Mizrahi, and this is The New CCO. There's nothing greater in life than uh, being able to share a friend with uh, other friends when you know uh, there's real value to those relationships. And Jim Hackett, somebody that I've been fortunate enough to not only know, uh, we sat on a board together for uh, over a decade, but um, who I have found to be one of those people that inspire your life through their own thoughts and through provoking you to think differently. So in addition to any substance we're going to uh, cover in terms of whether it's mobility or anything else, I think more than anything else, Jim is one of those out-of-the-box thinkers that you meet during your lifetime that gets you to look at the world a little differently and make better judgments and make better decisions. Um, He comes to our panel with a lifetime of experience as CEOs. He was the CEO at Steelcase for many years where he redesigned the whole way we work through these open workstations. Everybody's kind of familiar with Steelcase. And then when he thought he was retiring, um, he got drafted, literally, by the University of Michigan as their interim athletic director, um, again, to fix a problem and to get them to think differently about how they were going to do athletics for the future. And all the time was on the, uh, was on the board of Ford Motor Company, where they uh, were a bill for it, came to him and said, you know, we need to be better prepared for the future. And so I really want you to help me out and just for a small time and get all of our mobility uh, issues and electronic uh, vehicles and all of that organized so that we can leapfrog for the future. And when he did all of that, he said, you may as well run the company. And uh, by then, Jim was prepared to retire, but um, said he'd give them a few years to get them kind of fit for purpose for the future. And um, that's the kind of person that is sitting next to me. And I hope we can use this time um, productively to talk a little bit about, you know, how can we all, um, you know, something that was just said in the last session, instead of snapping back to where we were, how can we use this time to pivot? And what is it about Jim's experience um, in addressing some of these issues for the future that allowed him to get um, a battleship to pivot um, and have the the car that he uh, was part of this redesign be the car of the year? So, um, Jim, you know, I, I think that one of the things that I always find is that um, you bring you inspire vision wherever you go. And so I hope we're going to be able to get into a little bit of that. So um, why don't we start by just talking a little bit about um, what prepared you to be such a change agent. And maybe you want to describe a little bit about the, the, the challenges and opportunities you faced at Ford and what you brought to the table. You bet. Well, let me just add my thanks to Paige for uh, inviting me and my friend Marjorie serving together for 10 years in a boardroom. We met six times a year. Um, I said yesterday that Marjorie was a person because of her networks that would come in the boardroom of a hundred plus 
year old company and be asking them, are you sure you're thinking about this right? And I, I felt, as you heard Marjorie describe my background, I really identified with her quite quickly and listened to her often and looked forward to when she would come back from Davos and what have you to, to tell me what was going on in the world. So thank you for sharing the stage. I think, you know, it's hard in the short time to give you an intimate glimpse into who, I'm, who I am and where I come from, but I think it starts with having great parents. Uh, my father was a veterinarian uh, and an inventor, and my mother was an artist. So at our dinner table with three older brothers, uh, it was very combative and, and competitive, which helps in the role of the CEO. But we explored all kinds of topics. Uh, my dad was noted for animal husbandry and waste management in the 60s. He got a, an award from Ted Kennedy, who was heading uh, at the time environmental committee in, in the Congress and Senate. So watching him, his eyes got big when he would talk about something new. Flip to my mom, we had a little, a little town in Ohio where she painted the sets for the community play, listening to American ballet discussions. I brought back watching my mom, she had this friend, and they would, they would have like a six pack of Cokes and like four packs of cigarettes. And they drank all the Coke and smoked all the cigarettes while they were painting. Um, I don't think there was anything funny in the tobacco, but you know, who knows? And, um, <laughs> and so we flipped back and forth as a, you know, where there was this unbounded kind of influence. And I, I come out of college at Michigan and go to Procter & Gamble, which was known as an academy company. You go to kind of learn how to be. And <clears throat> what it taught me was I didn't like the structure of that, although I loved Procter & Gamble. A.G. Laffley became a really good friend had quite an alumni group in my uh, food division with Meg Whitman and Steve Ballmer and Scott Cook and Dave Brandon. <clears throat> so, you know, that taught me and, and my wife, uh, my college sweetheart, w went to work for Steelcase and that, that introduces me to that. And what that teaches me, um, it's a family derived business at the time, it was private. And I liked that she could call the chairman by his first name. Uh, instead of Mr. And, and the informality as I'm dressed today really mattered to me. Um, you know, fast forward, all those influences climbing. Uh, when I get in the job at Steelcase, it's number one in the industry, but I'm worried about the open office. The cubicle was, Dilbert was really poking at it properly. And I kind of reasoned that the weight of the computer and the connectedness of the phone made the workstation work. Like you had to go to your workstation to be connected, what happened if that disconnected? And that led us into a whole theory about the nature of teamwork. Uh, I meet David Kelly, uh, the founder of IDEO, and now running the D School at Stanford. I buy the company. Uh, they were private, we were private, we didn't tell anybody for four years. And I was able to kind of model in the spirit of working with David, Steve Jobs was his best man, what design meant in running a company. So design in the broadest terms for me is a problem solving mechanism. And so if I was getting ready to run an auto company, the platform to develop all this was Steelcase. And they're similar, industrial, uh, dealer, uh, distributed, um, global, family. Um, the themes, the, the memes were the same and uh, but Ford was a lot more difficult, and we'll talk about trying to get them to understand why we have to get rid of the glove box, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, um, so you are happily semi-retired anyway. You're on the board, and you get a phone call um, to what? Can you explain a little bit about what the mobility challenge was that Bill <clears throat> Ford asked you to address, and how you addressed that? You got, it's hard to remember. In fact, today's big news for Ford, you know, we, we just announced a massive investment. It's the largest, I think, in, in the next few years in terms of automotive investment, 11,000 new jobs, getting ready for the next generation. At that time, Alan Mulally is celebrated as a CEO, is finishing up, and all the news that was running in Bill's mind was around Uber, that people weren't gonna have vehicles. 
Tesla was just a wink of an eye. Um, but there was rumors that Google and Apple and others were interested. So the fear of disruption just surrounded. Bill frustrated, frankly, because he has control of the business, but it's a public company. Uh, built uh, an investment in a um, VC firm called Fontanella's, which actually accelerated the way he got exposed to deals. And people would come to him ostensibly to see if Ford might be interested in an idea. And there was a separation of church and state with all that, but, but it did expose him to lots of ideas. And so he kind of comes with this bundle of challenges. Got all these ideas, Jim, I've got this disruption, and what, what does the company do? I'm not sitting on the answer, hoping that we can guess it, but I do have a method for kind of parsing through that um, that I was going to deploy. And so we're sitting in Palo Alto. We took the board out there. I, I wanted to explain uh, what design thinking was. So we got the board when I was on the board to go to Palo Alto. And uh, we, we brought the founder of Nest in, uh, who was a Michigan grad and I knew really well. And he was explaining how he was devising Nest. And I watched the board's eyes roll in the back of their heads like, this, the, the nature of the way you intuit something that isn't here is really hard for lots of people. Not everyone, not trying to uh, diss you know, people in the boardroom, but I just would say this is the problem that Bill felt too. In, in entrenched systems, 100-year-old companies, this is really hard to imagine uh, that there's a new world, a new kind of order. And he said, why don't you come and do this thing where you just imagine that for me. And I go, well, Bill, I, if I wanted to run a business, I'd stay at Steelcase. I mean, we were humming and it was really working. This new idea that I hinted about was taking off. <clears throat> he said, uh, well, no, you just come and be chairman of the entity. I thought we were like two kids playing office. You know, we just made up titles. And, but the mission, and Mark Fields, who was the CEO, embraced it, uh, was to come in and imagine those pieces that I just told you. And what I started to say is, if you look back, the investment community was wildly optimistic about ride sharing. I was in the press saying, don't be too quick to, to, to suggest that. Based on some science of behavioral economics, people use their vehicles for signaling. I mean, what other asset do you have in your life that only works 90% or 10% of the time, meaning it's parked 90% of the time? and then you're financing it, you know. Um, it's because you love the freedom. And guess what happened after the pandemic? I'll just put this in as an anecdote. The used car market explodes because people got rid of their vehicles thinking that they wanted a life in ride sharing. We reasoned, and this isn't our purpose in the short time here, that if the environment, which we both care deeply about, needed to have an enhanced model we didn't have to give up vehicles to do that. We just make the vehicles more environmentally friendly, which is what the news is about today. And people could pair that with, and this was the big idea, a transportation operating system. So that went over like a lead balloon in Detroit, but basically it meant that the vehicles are so intelligent, they can drive themselves, but they can also be choreographed. Um, and choreographed in a way so that you minimize the traffic disruption. So I gave a, a longer talk at CES about this, trying to appeal the technologists to help us build this transportation operating system because it's it touches everything, and and the edge of the Internet of Things or edge computing is really required. So the vehicle is getting smarter, the edge is getting smarter. We can now combat the pollution problems because of the way traffic is really uh, reducing uh, in performance. That was the, the basis for me coming into the business. As I got into it, um, you know, reluctantly, uh, it, it was, Jim, you got to help us think. We got to think about the vehicle differently. How can you help us? So Marjorie, just give me 30 seconds to explain this glove box. And Yeah, and I think it would be good because I know I was shocked when we first started talking, once you became, you knew you were going to be CEO, when I asked you about your competitors. And, you know, what would you expect, right? Uh, all the logical competitors. 
And Jim said his biggest competitor was Apple. And I, I just think in terms of getting your head around what he's talking about, it would be great as part of the glove box to also let people know kind of what you see in the future there that you're moving toward okay. because it so revolutionizes the way we even think about our vehicles and mobility. So in the list of people here and online today, I know many of the CEOs of the businesses you represent uh, from all the years I got to do this. And so this is classic, right, where there's examples of what we would say are sticky attributes of a business that haven't changed. Let's talk about the one reason they're sticky is because humans are attached to it. So we're not, we're not in and out of fashion. We change fashionably. Uh, we, we get better. We, we evolve, but we're in the picture. So something like a glove box, we could make a trivia bet here. Does anyone know why there is a glove box in a car? It's because it stored gloves. What were the gloves for? It was to crank the car, <laughs> to start it. And, and so I would ask the question, you know, if, if, if the crank is gone, why is there the glove box? While my community at Ford would look at me, some of them, these are PhD level, people would say, well, let it, Jim, do you understand where that is and how we make, yeah, I understand it. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, if you're black, and you're pulled over, and you reach to get the registration out of there, it's a frightening moment for everybody. You know, um, why, don't, why is the registration for the driver over there? Why isn't, why isn't it on them? Why isn't it in the windshield? So, and we give the, the police a, uh, a UV light, and they just shine it on the windshield. You know, it goes away. Um, I would do this in, because this is the way Apple, who I remember I hinted, David and Steve, this is the way Apple looks at problems. And so Jeff Bezos also perfects this in another way. The people in our businesses that are 100 years old are plums for them because we don't reinterpret the nature of use and the perspective. Now, Marjorie said, if you use that technique, you heard me in that story, I made all that up. But here's the method, is you take the human need to display their registration. And with blockchain, this is gonna get even more simplified. But let's just say before that's all realized, what you do is you imagine what's the core rule for the registration? And it's in the exchange with uh, a mistake you've made and a policeman stopping you. So it's about identity and connectedness. So use design to say, what's the best way to give reassurance of that so that we don't create all this conflict? If you go out in the future, then you always have to, you always have to fuse technology to that. It's not because I love tech. It's because it's the only way you get the fitness of the answer to break the stickiness of the old one. And that's, that's rooted in science as well. That's a second method. Santa Fe believes that systems reach the epoch of fitness only to be upended by the next system, only to be upended by the next system. At the time the incumbents facing that moment, I'm really simplifying this for the crowd, the incumbent system is not willing to give up the virtues that made it reach the epoch of performance. At Steelcase, we use piecework system to get a part advantage, but once China could produce furniture, they didn't need, we had a disadvantage. At Ford, we, we, we love the fact that we get to maintain your vehicles and we get to direct that service to our dealers. In the future, it's there. But with the car connected, you could service much of what it needs to be done without, you could be a customer instead of for, two days when you're buying it, and then we never talk to you again. We talk to you every day. So those two principles, Marjorie, of you have to fuse technology to break the stickiness, and in parallel, you're, the new design is trying to be more fit. It's not cooler, not better looking, more fit. And fitness means faster, lower cost. People love it better. Um, but fitness is, is, a, is a truth. Like I said, humans are a persistent measure over time. Fitness in any business 
never goes out of fashion. Because every year, you're in a meeting where someone's asking you to revive your budget and justify what you've spent or what you're going to spend or why can't you reduce. It makes business awful when you're in business and somebody's doing that to you all the time. I tried to change that narrative when I was at Steel Case and I took it to Ford, which is let's quit doing that to each other. Spread everything off the table, all these PowerPoints about efficiency and all that. What's the best design to win? To win handily. And you're now starting to see this come from Ford in really cool ways. I hinted about the glove box, you hear about electrics, the cars are connected. We created a six um, facility around the world, six facilities called D for the word design, dot Ford. This isn't car design, this is understanding human use so that we do what I just told you. We, we, we see if we can fuse technology to get an advantage and we say, is there a more fit attribute um, that we're trying to drive to? So what does that look like? Just, just if you, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I'm like, I like to envision these things for the future, but so. <laughs> well, and I have to be careful because I, you know, oh, right. I, I, can't, I can't, so tell, can't but I can't, but I can tell you, I can tell just you. Just generically, well, what gener can you expect from it? Sure. Well, okay. generically, in your lifetime, you used to have to worry about the size of the vehicle and its uh, efficiency for fuel. That's gone away. In your lifetime, you had to trade comfort for fuel efficiency. That's going away. In your lifetime, if one of your children um, were driving, you would worry they might wreck. And sadly, that happens. I pray that no one in the rooms had to deal with that. That will go away. These, these vehicles won't wreck in the future. My colleague, I grew up in London, Ohio, so nationwide I know really well. Insurance is going to go through tremendous disruption because the risk pools change. Because we're now, the way we insure vehicles is we look at driver behavior and, and bad intersections and we ma marry the two. That goes away. It doesn't mean insurance goes away. It just means that the collective intelligence of the edge and the car are communicating. Here's an example. In Ann Arbor, um, because it's near Dearborn, we, we asked them to let us put the early bones of the transportation operating system in place. Simple thing, we want, to, we want to understand two things. Where does everyone park when they're not on the street, meaning parking garages? Because the university and the town, these parking garages cost $40 million to build. If we have to build another one, do we need it? And then the second thing we wanted to know is what I just hinted about is how dangerous are certain intersections. Do you know that after we did the study, they had so much capacity in the parking garages, they could get rid of some. And they go, well, how's that possible? Every time I pull in a parking garage, there's no parking places. That goes away in the future because the vehicle and the space, the vehicle and the edge are talking to each other. It knows exactly where there's an opening. And in fact, you just can play with the design of this you can guide it, so how long are you gonna be in there? Do you wanna leave before the rest of the football team game is emptying so you don't get caught in a parking garage? All the intelligent attributes for the way you wanna behave get designed in the future of the vehicle and this edge. In the intersection management, we found there are certain intersections where the probability of accidents go way up. Insurance companies have this, but why is that propensity high? It can be sight lines, it can be, it's next to something that's distracting you, that goes away in the future. Because the vehicle learns about these kinds of things and starts to adjust. In Pittsburgh, where we started the self-driving division Argo, we've been three years driving. There's an intersection, the vehicle goes through it 17 times a day. For two years, it went through 17 times a day and we measured the throughput. In the third year, I said, I'm sorry it sounds like I did all this, I didn't, but I, I was pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Let's put a smart agent, this is the edge, in the intersection, like up on the camera. And as the smart vehicle, the autonomous vehicle approaches the intersection, this thing's transmitting, like bits are going through uh, you know, computing lines, what's the traffic flows? 
Do you know we improved the throughput of the autonomous vehicle by 40%, changing nothing else but this system forecasting the speed that it should stop and start to go through. It's a little hard to understand that because you go, how's that possible if everything stops and starts? It's the spaces, it's the distance, it's the what I break versus you break. It's just infinitely more complex. So Marjorie, that, that's what happens in a world with intelligence. It's also a scary world if a bad actor gets control of a vehicle and fills it with dynamite and wants to drive it into something. So we're working really hard, you know, around the world with standards. I'm a big believer that if, if you augment humans with more and better and they're good, you get more good. But I'm also a realist that when the internet came out, the number one revenue generator was pornography. So it takes, it takes people that are leaders, you know, to say this is what our purpose is and this is how we're gonna use that special so power. So one, one reason, Jim, I wanted you to go into a little more detail on this is that this applies to everything we do. You know, and I think COVID taught us that we need, that sometimes we need to pivot very fast. We need to think differently. We need to get out of the way of ourselves. And I just thought, and this is what Jim has done his whole life, which is what I admire and respect. And I think the car example is just one because you can extrapolate from what he just said and apply it to anything. And um, if we're not going to be obsolete, then we need to be thinking ahead of the curve and we need to know what those tipping points are and when to pivot. And so um, that that was really what why I thought this was such an important example. And I would just say that as communicators, Jim, in this world that's changing so fast, what what um, special role or how, how can we stay relevant at the table or are we more relevant than ever? How, how do we help in this transition? Yeah, well, let me just humbly tell you, I'm, I'm not the second coming because otherwise, um, you know, I would, I, I mean, I know in the limited um, skills I have versus the expanded skills I have, the hardest thing for me was to communicate these abstractions. I, I would develop a chart if abstraction was low to high and the distance from it uh, happening was now versus far, you had a real problem. I mean, Wall Street is not gonna wanna talk about the throughput in Pittsburgh, but the Ford family cares about it because they're long-term investors. The employees care about it. The dealers, they were in between those two worlds because they have to sell something the next hour. So the role of communications for me at Ford, and Mark Truby's a member of Page, became really prescient. I, I started to understand, I, I had wonderful teams at Steelcase, and we were number one in the world, so we were used to being busy, but I had no idea uh, when, you know, we got uh, almost three billion impressions when the Bronco came out the night it launched on the, on the web. So I, I wasn't used to that kind of statement, Marjorie, and what you need is a professional team, and I'll brag about Mark. I think I, I brought to Mark the way the creative aspects that I just walked you through could be applied to the way you look at the historic system. I could help him look out further. What he did for me, and I, I, I wasn't in the morning session, but Marjorie briefed me, he was a journalist, and when he became head of comms, he could edit those two billion impressions down for me the way an editor in a, in a news periodical. Think of everything coming to a city editor that's going on and he has to decide what the headlines are and what the lead stories are. Plus he, was, he, won, he won prizes, journalistic prizes for long lived stories in West Virginia. So I, 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 I liked Mark when I knew him on the board but I fell in love with him by the time I left because I never worked with anybody who cared so much about this all holding together. And I know you wonder if the boss knows, notices that. If they're in a job like this, they do, because the chaos is just constant. And, um, and so I would also leave you with a simple suggestion. If you can map landscape-wise for the CEO, the way the topics are varied and how you decide to 
to manage those to which constituents through which method. Because all three of those things are moving in a cubic way that looks to me like, you know, air traffic. And so when you come in and you say, hey, here's your talking points for CNN, I, I did focus, but my brain is back in that big chaotic world thinking everything that I'm talking about is in the context of this. How do I make that clear for the, for the audience? By the time I got done, I got better at it, but I was not, not good at it at the beginning. And, and so I, I re relish now, uh, as we take questions, that I found out my principal role and the reason I was brought in is to break these boundaries so that we go there. And so today's news, you got to understand the joy I feel in seeing that come to fruition because those are things we worked on together. Okay. Now you can applaud. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode of The New CCO, be sure to check out our latest episodes and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, leave us a rating and a review. We want to hear what you think so that we can keep making this podcast more interesting and valuable to you. To find out more about what's happening at PAGE, please visit us at page.org. Special thanks go to Rivet Smart Audio, our podcast sponsors. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring this podcast to you. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on The New CCO.